On this special edition of Independent Sources, the aging tsunami preparing for a population that is increasingly immigrant and increasingly elderly. It's a question of the fact that the services are, are there, are available, but they're not always reaching the, the senior populations, the new immigrant senior populations that are now the major part of the city. And a dance for the ages, using movement and music as therapy for seniors. Watching how these ladies are growing late in their lives, how they're growing, that's incredible. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Abby Ashola. This week, we're going to take a special look at the city's graying population. New York is often glamorized as a youthful metropolis filled with ageless citizens moving and working at light speed. But the truth is the city is aging and doing so rapidly. A report from the Center for an Urban Future estimates that the number of senior citizens living in the city will increase by 35 percent over the next 20 years. This has some senior advocates asking whether the city is ready to deal with that reality, especially after a recent slashing of the budget for the elderly. Sarah Pizan spoke with one of the researchers on the report, Christian Gonzalez Rivera, and advocate for the elderly, Bobby Sackman, about some of the details of the report and why the city is falling behind on its senior care. So Christian, why aren't these immigrant seniors getting help? And let's break it down. The first thing to notice is that the, the, the city is actually getting older. I mean, right now there's about one million seniors in the city, and by 2030 there's going to be even more. Um, and not only are we getting more seniors, but also the composition of seniors are changing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot more seniors from Asia, from Latin America, yet the services that we have available for older people are not always reaching this new influx of older immigrants mm -hmm. that, are, that are coming in. And so it's a question of the fact that the services are, are there, are available, mm -hmm. but they're not always reaching the, the senior populations, the new immigrant senior populations that are now the major part of the city. And so what is it? Is it a, is it a problem like a language barrier? Uh, what are the issues? Why, why are they not aware of these? Uh... There's several things going on. I mean, the, the first part is the fact that, yes, two out of every three uh, older immigrants in the city mm -hmm. don't speak English very well. And so it's a matter of unless you have somebody who through word of mouth in your community can tell you these services are available, make sure you access them. Uh, there's a lot of immigrant seniors that are just not accessing these services for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, moreover, there's different cultures that have different attitudes, let's say, I mean, different sort of relationships towards mm -hmm. asking for services, what they consider the, fa the family's responsibility to be mm -hmm. in terms of caretaking, what they feel more comfortable reaching outside. So it's really not only just a language issue, but also a cultural competency issue. So not only do the services have to be available in language, but also people have to outreach and sort of using those cultural soft skills that will allow people to, to say it's okay to, to, to reach out for services, while not everyone knows about that. And Bobby, you, you have a lot of experience uh, with, um, with elders as well. Mm. What has been your, your take on this? About I, I agree with what Christian has said. I think if you're going for a benefit, you know, maybe it's food stamps or Medicaid, for example, um, that interaction with government can be uncomfortable for the reasons he said and also based on what their country of origin might have been and their mm -hmm. relationship to government. In some neighborhoods, immigrants are flocking to the senior centers. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it is a bit of, uh, of a mixed bag. And um, we remain, you know, we want the city and the state to recognize that th there's an overall, there's an aging tsunami. I mean, there's no other way to put this. By, um, we will have doubled the elderly population between 2000 and 2030, by the time 2030 comes around. And so how we are going to, um, not only just care for, for older adults, but, but also they bring great economic impact as well. They bring in benefits. They bring in Social Security. They bring in, in, in other um, income into communities. And I think what's also happening with, with elderly immigrants in particular, as you mentioned, Christian, they're coming here old, which is somewhat of a new phenomenon. It used to be you came here, you were younger, you aged in, but you raised your family, whatever. But they're coming here elderly, and that's got to be a huge culture shock to them and and then their families become more americanized the kids the adult children go out to work the kids go to school they learn english and there's grandma and granddad and, and sometimes it's hard for them 
to find their place. Sometimes they go to a senior center or they may go somewhere else. And I think what needs to be kept in mind is, is looking at, at this as a family issue and what, what are the family supports that are needed so you don't come here to take care of your family and a few years down the road you find yourself pretty isolated. Right. And you don't really know quite where to turn at all. Christian, in your report, you also mentioned that these immigrant seniors tend to be a lot poorer than their native counterpart. Why is that the case? Well, the number one reason is that one-third of older immigrants in New York City have zero Social Security income. And, of course, I mean, any senior will be able to tell you that. I mean, that Social Security check every month is, is an extremely important part of, the, of being able to maintain a fixed income. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of seniors don't have that. And moreover, I mean, it's like as, as Bobby was saying, uh, uh, people who immigrate to this country when they're older are less likely to have worked the required 10 years you know, that you need in order to get Social Security benefits, in order to get many of the benefits that are available on the federal level. So without those kinds of benefits, your income is, is very precarious. So you have a lot of older immigrants that are still working into older age just to make ends meet. Or, unfortunately, depending also on their families, whose incomes might be lower as well, to also support them. And uh, so who are, let's talk about where these ethnic elders come from. Uh, have you seen a, a, you know, a trend? Where, do, where are they coming from? Well, the biggest increase in the past 10 years has been um, from a, seniors from the, from the West Indies, I mean, from the Dominican Republic, from Haiti, from that area as well. Though there's also been a huge increase in the Chinese, Korean, and Russian populations as well. And if I could just jump in for a moment, I, I think that New York City um, has the most uh, extensive com community-based service network for seniors in the country. Mm -hmm. Having said that, because of the high number of seniors, the density of the population, the diversity, there, there were so under-resourced, we don't have enough money for services. There were huge cuts under the former administration of Mayor Bloomberg, over $50 million were cut to the Department for the Aging. At the same time, the numbers and the diversity is growing. And I think the message to whether it's city council or state and federal leaders is when you're looking at income equality, when you're looking at equality in neighborhoods, it can't stop at a certain age. It has to go across the lifespan. It impacts families, as we've said, and it obviously impacts the older adult themselves. And so how do we, how do we build communities that support all, all ages? And I think that's still an uphill struggle that we have here. I was going to ask you, Bombi, what is, how is the city currently approaching the issue? I, I, think, I think what's happened is, is that we're way behind. I mean, I don't think there's other, any other, you know, two other ways to say it or whatever, that, um, as I said, we, we've lost over $50 million in services in, in seven or eight years. And so how do we build that back but also then enhance what we have? We're, we're way behind. Um, even in the whole affordable housing arena, which is getting a lot of attention now, upwards of about almost 100,000 senior citizens are paying more than 50 percent of their income in rent. So we're really seeing a lot of, of struggle And how do we incorporate elderly immigrants into that and make sure, again, that every conversation we have about income equality, about building poor neighborhoods, you know, strengthening low-income communities, it can't stop at the age of 60, 65, or whatever age. It has to be across that lifespan, or, or it doesn't support the families, it doesn't support the communities. And also, too, I mean, to, to piggyback off of that as well, for the services that we do have available for older people, I mean, the Department for the Aging has had some of its senior services contracts for many decades. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that those contracts that we do have available, that we're making the most out of them by making sure that all those agencies are outreaching to older immigrant uh, uh, populations. Um, and I mean, there's plenty of examples of that around the city as well. I mean, there are senior services organizations that were founded to serve a, a Jewish population right after the, uh, the Second World War. But now the population, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about um, self-help services in, um, in, in Flushing. Flushing. Yeah, in yeah. Flushing. Yeah. And so now that area is mostly a Chinese and Korean population. Mm -hmm. And they've been able to shift their services, their personnel, their outreach to reflect that new population. We need to make sure that's happening across the city. Yeah, and, and there's, you know, and the other side of that is, is sometimes there are issues where if, if a group um, is really intimately based within a certain culture, they can bring a nuance of sensitivity 
we, we um, had a press conference on World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, and they really, how families deal with something as sensitive as elder abuse is going to be really different in every culture, what, what they even mm -hmm. consider elder abuse to be, you know, how you right. behave between family members and then if you need to seek help and the difficulty you might find in that because, again, of your family structure and all, and, and lack of services, I would add. We need more services. You know, so it's, it's the nuances. And, and I, so I think it's a combination of using the existing infrastructure, making sure they're culturally competent, but it's also bringing in new players and saying, you know, can we work in collaboration? You know, if we have more money, can we have additional contracts? You know, how do, how do, we, how do we work this out? Because the city never stops changing. Whatever, whatever is true for young people in terms of diversity, it's no different for older adults. Mm -hmm. It's the same constant churning of the different groups that live here. So, Well, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Still to come on the show, using dance to teach seniors about their roots and improve their health. We'll be back right after this. Staying tuned to our special look at the city's aging population. Art therapy can take many forms. At Highbridge Senior Center, Jose Ortiz, aka Dr. Drum, is training seniors to drum, sing, and do bomba, the folkloric dance of Puerto Rico. Judith Escalona tells us more about the program in this report. What began as a cultural program for youth has evolved into a performance workshop for seniors with some unexpected results. It was like an open community project, trying to bring in people from, you know, um, from all over to come in. And, and, and at first I thought it was going to be uh, youth focused, but, you know, adults were coming in. Jose Ortiz, a.k.a. Dr. Drum, found he was filling a void that was intergenerational. And when I asked the question, how many of you know about Bomba, many of them raised their hands. Then when I asked, how many of you have danced Bomba, none raised their hands. And the story was, when they were small, when they were children, that they would see the Bombas, but they could not go to the dance. Now they're not only going to the dance, they're performing it. Four years ago, Ortiz began working with the elderly at Casabe Senior Houses, located in Spanish Harlem and created a dance troupe, Los Robles de Casabe. Teresa Fortuna is in her 80s. She's an original member. In certain occasions, I was in my house, because I do things in my house. Then, sometimes, I finished my things. Then, I was very sad, until I was crying. Things changed when Fortuna started taking the Bomba workshop. Me siento grande, me siento hermosa, es la verdad. Me ayudó físicamente, me ayudó socialmente. Y, y en esos pensamientos que yo tenía y esa tristeza, pues gracias a Dios, se me ha quitado. Dr. Drum's organization, Bombayo, seeks to preserve and promote Bomba as part of Puerto Rico's cultural heritage. Bomba is a folkloric dance fusing African, Spanish, and indigenous elements. Isabel Trinidad is from the Dominican Republic. Le digo al profe, me dice, mire, digo, mire, yo no pensaba que usted me iba a aceptar a mi edad en su grupo. Y usted me aceptó. Pero mire, mientras te parado, estoy de la vida, aquí estoy con ustedes. No salgo jamás de aquí. <laughs> Porque me siento feliz. Something about getting up and able to help someone, you know, it's, a, it's such a rewarding feeling, you know, and, and watching how these ladies are growing late in their lives, how they're growing. That's incredible someone making a change in their lives at the age of 60. This is happening 
with, bom with the Bomba workshops. The workshop has also been a cultural awakening for Maria Davila. She discovered Ortiz is a taskmaster when it comes to learning the history of the music and how it was developed by enslaved Africans in Puerto Rico. I was interested in playing congas, you know, with different, different kinds of barrels. So uh, I walked in, I said, oh, Dr. Drum, yes, I want to learn how to play the barrel. She said, no, first you have to learn how to dance and learn our culture, and then we'll think about the barrels and the congas. Emerita Foster is New Yorican. Foster has been with Dr. Drum for two and a half years and is part of his all-woman drumming group, Las Perlas de Bombayo. Before I started doing the bomba, I was uh, doing my yoga class on Mondays, and then I would go to a center to uh, learn how to make the bracelets and, you know, jewelry. And, but once I came into bomba, I left those things behind. I'm just sticking by with the bomba. I think that if the bomba como que, no sé, un pajarito que le cortan nada. Creo yo casi me sentiría. Mientras existe la bomba, pues yo creo que yo sigo volando. Yes. Bomba is a healing art. The seniors seem to think so. Jose Ortiz thinks so too. That's how he got his name. Dr. Drum. Judith Escalona, Independent Sources. The Visiting Nurse Service of New York is partnering with several community organizations in the Rockaways to target at-risk individuals and their families. The Rockaway Wellness Partnership aims to help community members adopt healthier lifestyles and connect with available health care services. I spoke with the program's director, Karen Bassick, and wellness coach, Marjorie Saunter, about the program's progress. Welcome, ladies. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Karen, I'll start with you. Um, okay. Explain the work that's being done through the Visiting Nurse Service of New York Rockaway Wellness Partnership. It is a partnership that combines many different agencies, health, social service agencies, um, faith-based agencies, um, stores and businesses to try to affect the health of the residents of the community. We, we address anybody 18 and over and see people well into their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and we're trying to help them, empower them to take care of their, their health better than they've been. Many of them come and find us. We find them by being embedded in the community. We're in Stop and Shop and Key Food and Thrift Way Pharmacy. We're at Salvation Army, we're at, we're at food lines where people come to get food. We're in many different places where people don't necessarily come and see themselves as going to get health care. And we address them with whatever they see as their health needs. And that's very broad. For some, it may be immigration issues. It may mm -hmm. be needing health insurance. It might be the fact that they need eyeglasses or, or they can't afford their medication or they want to work on their diabetes uh, you know, management, or they want to lose 20 pounds. Okay. Uh, so many different kinds of issues that okay. come up. Marjorie, as a caseworker, explain the need that you've been seeing within the senior community specifically. Well, there's a lot of need for uh, nutritional uh, teaching. Um, a lot of people uh, are not really they're diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension, but they're not given a, a food plan. And that's the need that we've been finding where people are coming to us to learn how to eat properly to, to stay well. Um, but then upon interviewing them, we're finding out so many other uh, issues as well. Um, shall I just speak of one person that we've met oh, already? Please. Um, a, a dentist uh, who we had met in Thriftway Pharmacy, we found him there. Uh, one of our wellness workers, um, approached him, watching him read a card for about 10 minutes and asked him if he needed help reading it, you know, do you need glasses or, and he said that he, he needed, he couldn't see it. Wow. He hasn't been to the eye doctor because he um, confided in her that he was an illegal immigrant. Um, he came here on a work visa, it expired. He was trying to get his Im immigration status in order um, and he didn't have the money. The lawyer told him it would be over $6,000. Wow. So we were able to have another uh, one of our partners come down, NILAG. Which is New York Legal Assistance Group, 
who is now giving him free legal services. He happens to be married to an American. Yes. And he didn't realize that he could really get onto the, the track of becoming an American citizen. So through your so, program, he was able to figure out things for himself. Right. And we were another one of our, um, we were able to get him eyeglasses too, because he hasn't been to the doctor. He was scared about going to the doctor. He didn't have insurance, you know, so we were able to get him hooked up with another one of our partners, um, Harbor Optics, to get him a eye exam and a pair of glasses and he wasn't working because he couldn't see and he was a day laborer so now he can see and he can measure and he's been ever so thankful that he can now has glasses and he can see and he can work and he's paying his rent and um, it's it's stories like that that we feel like are so are those big stories typical within this program? Yeah. Yes really? you know I, I think when we started this I always felt if we could help one person it would be nice but we've had so many yeah, we've, we've uh, been helping in intensive counseling, and that may be for four sessions, it may be for 20, yeah. um, 144 people to date. Wow. Yeah. And we just started in April. I mean, again, so it's being a director of a program, I was worried we wouldn't find anybody. That's how I felt. But people are finding us, we're finding them, and I think we are helping to impact by empowering them to, to get the care they need. We're not trying to fix everything, we're trying to work on a motivational um, techniques to help them define what is the problem that they see, help them define goals, partialize those goals, and help them get some successes. I mean, this is true for whatever age and whatever their, the problems are that they're trying to address. There's a lot of people with mental illness out in the Rockways. There is very high diabetes. There is very, it has much higher um, health uh, problems in, in most indicators there. Cardiac disease is, is worse uh, than any place else in Queens or New York City. So there's a lot of people with a lot of issues and many people not connected to primary care. Wow. And we found a lot of people without insurance and we've been working with doctors on the world who will help people who don't have any insurance. So we've tried to connect and as a partnership program we're, we are really trying to identify all the agencies that are out there okay. that want to um, come together and not duplicate, but help to link each, with each other what is needed. Great, you, you said that um, Dennis was approaching a Thriftway yeah, store? Yeah, Thriftway Pharmacy. How do you guys usually approach people? Is that the way it's done well, usually? Thriftway Pharmacy is one of our areas, our hotspots that we call it, and we have a, uh, a, 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 a little an office table set up there and with our, with our signs, and um, I'm a nurse, another nurse, we have a social worker and our wellness workers. And um, people come by and they see us, they ask us what our program is about, we tell them what our program is. Um, we, we go up and down the aisles and we look for people that might, that might need the help and we tell them of our program and nine out of ten times somebody needs help. And uh, our program is free and uh, we've really been able to, to uh, find a lot of people and, and offer a lot of assistance. We also see ourselves doing this in a multi-modalities in that we are uh, in D giving talks. We've been running now walking groups. Yes. We're trying to get people out and moving. Um, we'll be starting a men's group. Mm -hmm. We have various education also in print media. Um, every month we have a different health topic. We'll be giving f free flu shots come the fall. And seniors will definitely and, benefit from absolutely that. Absolutely. <laughs> seniors will, and their home health aides will benefit. Anybody yeah. who's yeah. over 18 can use our program, but Often home health aides who take care of seniors don't have those free flu shots and we will be happy to give it to them too. So we will be in some of these hot spots and certainly advertise where we are to be able to do it. Okay. But the education has been also a very important way for us to meet people. If we give a talk on something, they then often come up to say, you know, I'd like to talk more about my own situation about falling or about um, mm. diabetes or about heart disease and hypertension. And do you see yourself expanding out to other boroughs? I know this is concentrated in the Rockaway area. This is a time-limited grant program that um, was funded by the state and goes through September 2015. However, we are and have applied for um, a bigger grant that will be part of um, a larger consortium of agencies and hospitals that we hope will continue the continue this program and expand it in, in Queens. Okay, Karen Bassick and Marjorie Saltner, thank you so much for being on the show.
Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. When we come back, seniors dive into a whole new world. Finally from us, earlier you heard how the city, though ahead of the curb nationally when it comes to elderly care, may still be falling short in certain areas. Xiphus LeBron highlights one of the city's summer programs that's getting some seniors to dive into new experiences. Lean back, legs together. Five, six, seven, eight, and one. It's the first day of this year's Senior Splash at the Thomas Jefferson Pool in East Harlem and some of the participants have been waiting all winter for the aquatic exercise program to get started up again. Man, I feel so super after this little workout. I can't even begin to tell you. I mean, I feel like a kid again, which is a nice feeling for when you're not a kid anymore. Rodriguez used to swim at this pool as a child. Now she lives in the Bronx. She made the trip downtown just for the water workout. I think we're all happy to be here, that we can do this, that it's an opportunity to, you know, socialize, get a little exercise, recreation. When you retire, you, you just can't sit around doing nothing because then you get really old and your muscles atrophy or whatever, and you got to keep yourself moving. It's Dolores Bates' first day at the pool, and the recent retiree is already having fun with the instructor. The workout lasts 45 minutes and targets the participants' core muscles as well as their arms and legs. Classes used to be held on Monday and Wednesday. This year, the Parks Department extended the program to include Friday. When we found out that it was three days a week and uh, we just, we were elated. Everybody was excited about that. The music is wonderful and uh, it's just too bad we don't have it every day, but it's good enough for us. So good that it's grown steadily over the last two years. The city's had similar success with programs in other boroughs. Over in Queens, Blanca Saravia has seen her program grow over the last eight years. Today is one of her off days from instructing a class. But when she does, she works out with over 100 seniors during each of her sessions. The youngest that I have is 62. And the oldest senior I have is a female. She's 94 years old. And she comes on a regular basis, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Most of these seniors, they want to get out from home and get out and come and do some activities in, in the water. It's like a therapy for them. It's also something that many of the participants in East Harlem never want to be without. What I really like about it is the healthy part of it. The fact that we're doing the exercise, that we're moving, there's a lot of people in this neighborhood who are in walkers, canes, and wheelchairs. And I think maybe if we had this some time ago, maybe they wouldn't be in those situations. The program runs until August 22nd. Seniors who are interested in Senior Splash can register at any one of the 16 participating pools in the five boroughs. Zyphus LeBron, Independent Sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for watching. Remember to tune into our new episode that will air in August. We'll tell you about some of the cultural and historical gems that have been lost or relocated around the city. Till next time, be independent minded.